Uh, and due to COVID-19, of course, um, today's hearing is being held uh, remotely and all members and witnesses uh, will be participating uh, via um, video conferencing. As part of our hearing, uh, microphones, of course, will be set on mute uh, to eliminate any background noise. We know how irritating that is especially when you're the one that's speaking and there's a lot of noise in the background. Uh, so members and witnesses, you have to remember to unmute your microphones uh, each time uh, you wish to speak. And documents for the record uh, should be sent to Megan uh, Mullen at the email address that we've provided uh, to your staffs and all documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of the hearing. Uh, the chair now recognizes herself uh, for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, my colleagues, in September of this year, uh, the five U.S. territories uh, will face a Medicaid cliff. And I use this term because it means that the supplementary Medicaid funding that's provided uh, to the territories through the Affordable Care Act uh, will run out. Now, without this federal funding, over one and a half million enrollees, including many children, uh, could lose their health care. Each is an American citizen, but they're treated differently than the constituents of every member of this subcommittee. Since 1967, the territories have struggled with inadequate federal funding for their Medicaid programs because the Social Security Act capped uh, Medicaid funding for the territories. So since 1978, Congress is on the record noting that the caps on the Medicaid programs severely affect the territory's health and budgets, but there's been no significant statutory change in, um, uh, to this part of the Social Security Act in over 55 years. So this is a very important hearing uh, that uh, I hope uh, we are going to build on and take action uh, to reverse what I'm referring to. Now, because of these restrictions, the territories routinely run out of Medicaid funds over the past decade. Congress has voted on six separate occasions to, pro uh, to provide stopgap funds to certain territories, including as recently as December uh, 2019 except for a temporary increase in federal funding in FY 2020 and 21, the funding for the territories is typically three to four times below what a state Medicaid program would receive. In the states, the Medicaid program has a flexible financing, uh, uh, fina a financing structure which guarantees funding if more individuals enroll due to an economic downturn, a pandemic, uh, or a natural disaster. For the rest of us, that's the way it works, but not for the territories. Uh, so the territories do not have any guarantee. When disaster strikes, the territories are forced to make hard decisions about coverage and services at the worst possible time. Just when they need it most, that's when it hurts them the most. Fortunately, during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and economic downturn, the territories have benefited from an increased federal match for fiscal years 20 and 21. American Samoa, the Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands received an 83% federal match, and Puerto Rico's current federal match is 76%. Uh, with this additional money, Puerto Rico was able to cover the cure for hepatitis C for Medicaid patients for the very first time, and the Northern Mariana Islands were able to establish an oncology center to provide cancer treatment locally. But this funding, colleagues, is going to expire on September 30th, which is why the territories obvious, obviously need a long-term solution to their Medicaid funding to, so that they too can meet the needs of their constituents as we all work to meet the needs of ours. 
In Puerto Rico, 85% of residents report they're worried that they'll be unable to access health care if they need it. In American Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands, the public hospitals face staff shortages due to low salaries, poor infrastructure, and high rates of uncompensated care. So if we allow the Medicaid cliff to happen, each of the territories would have to cut, now listen to this, they would have to cut 69 to 94% of their Medicaid program in fiscal year 22. Uh, obviously, percentages this high, we all know, uh, produce uh, dire consequences, um, and it would uh, to hundreds of thousands of American citizens. So uh, we cannot fail to care for so many American citizens based solely on where they live. Uh, I think uh, uh, we could probably all agree that this is short-term thinking, except the short-term thinking has been around for an awfully long time, and it has cost the constituents of our colleagues that are with us today to testify. I'm so um, happy to welcome each one of the representatives. Uh, my hope is that the hearing will clear a path forward to a long-term financing solution that fits the needs of the territories and uh, our fellow Americans um, who are part of them. Uh, so thank you and welcome to our witnesses. Uh, we welcome you very warmly to our subcommittee. The chair now recognizes Mr. Guthrie, uh, who is the wonderful ranking member of our subcommittee for his five minutes uh, uh, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate that very much. And thank you for this important hearing. And I want to thank uh, the witnesses. I want to thank my colleagues for being here today uh, to representing the people you represent and want to hopefully we can move forward on this hearing. So today, Medicaid funding for five U.S. territories expires September 30th. And I am concerned the result of such an expiration would have a devastating impact on the residents of, in each of these territories. I am committed to working in a bipartisan way to find a solution that avoids this funding clip. But unfortunately, the two bills we're discussing today miss the mark and are not bipartisan I want to examine how these programs are working for people in the territories while also improving program integrity and maintaining congressional oversight. We should be working together to achieve these goals to ultimately help these Americans. The hearing today is on the Medicaid programs in the U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, and Puerto Rico. The federal government is projected to spend around $3 billion on these programs this year or roughly half of the annual budget of the FDA. These five programs cover a little over 1.3 million people, but over 90% of those are in Puerto Rico. For comparison, in my home state of Kentucky, about one and a half million people participate in Medicaid. This committee has a proud history of working together on these programs. Two years ago, we passed unanimously out of committee a bill that would have increased funding for four years in Puerto Rico and six years for the other territories. These bipartisan extensions included new program integrity measures for each program to make sure federal dollars being spent on the people in these programs. Congress ended up increasing funding for two years for all five programs, so we are again here to examine ways to move forward. However, I must point out that technically, this hearing is a legislative hearing. Although Congress recently passed in a bipartisan way, the most substantial increase in funding ever to these programs before us are two partisan bills that remove any guardrails on the amount of federal spending. We anticipate these bills will cost tens of billions of dollars and include no policy changes to address program integrity, health outcomes, and a framework for increased flexibility. Instead of this partisan approach, we should first look at how the bipartisan measures of increased funding and accountability have worked and what measures should be continued. It is my hope that the majority will return to the bipartisan tradition of working together on this issue moving forward. Although it's unfortunate the majority chose to start the discussion on these programs with a partisan legislative hearing today, today's hearing is important to discuss the territory specific needs. Too often, Congress lumps all five programs together, but as we know, we have five distinct populations with five distinct programs 
with five sets of challenges and program designs. Understanding the differences in the programs and making sure any extension considers the unique needs of each population will be key. We also want to have an open and robust conversation on the program integrity measures that the territories have been working on over the past two years. The Government Accountability Office is here today to discuss their report on the contracting issues Puerto Rico and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services have had with Puerto Rico's contracting practices. In addition to work G to the work GAO is doing, the Department of Health and Human Services Off-Term Inspector General is also conducting two audits of Puerto Rico's Medicaid program. Working with them this spring and summer will be of paramount importance as we want to be sure that any issues identified are addressed as we work to continue this important funding. Finally, I just want to iterate my strong desire for this work to be bipartisan. We have seen time and time again that simply pouring money into something doesn't fix the underlying problem. We can address funding needs for U.S. territories while also ensuring programs better serve residents and program integrity measures are in place. We can do this together and we can do it like we do it together like we have in the past. I look forward to the discussion and I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, I, I want to say to the gentleman that we have worked with the minority uh, to build this uh, hearing. Uh, we worked together on, on the witnesses. Uh, yes, there are pieces of legislation out there. Uh, we welcome the minority uh, putting forth legislation uh, and or working uh, uh, with the uh, two uh, main authors of legislation relative to the subject matter uh, of our hearing. Uh, but uh, uh, th this is not partisan. This is bipartisan. This is about American citizens. And um, so I look forward to hearing from them. And uh, uh, the gentleman yields back. I now would like to uh, recognize Mr. Pallone, the chairman of the full committee, for his five minutes of questions. Well, thank you, Congresswoman and Chairwoman um, Eshu. And I know not only this is an important hearing, but this is something that you care very much about. And for, for I hope I'm not missing anybody, but I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the input from all the Congress people that represent the territories. I mean, I just have to say, you know, Congressman Sablon has been, I don't think a day goes by without him mentioning this issue to me. And certainly when, I think it was in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, I don't know, we've had so many hurricanes that I, I can't even remember which the name of it, but I think it was Maria. When we went down to um, the Virgin Islands with Congresswoman Plaskett and, and with uh, Congress, with, with Jennifer, with Congresswoman Gonzalez, um, and they were talking about this, you know, the whole time, how we need a permanent solution. This just can't be done, you know, by kicking the can down the road. And of course, ever since he's been elected, uh, Congressman said Nicholas has been talking to me about it as well. In addition to that, you know, you have, uh, you know, uh, members like uh, Congressman uh, Soto on our committee and Congresswoman Velasquez, who are of uh, Puerto Rican descent, who, um, you know, who constantly bring this to our attention and, and want solutions. So, you look, uh, all of you have been so helpful. And so I'm glad that we're having this hearing today and all of you have an opportunity to express your views. It wasn't that long ago that we had our last hearing on how disastrous it would be for Medicaid funding in the territories to collapse. And I was proud that we were able to work together on a strong bipartisan bill that combined critical increases to the territory's funding and federal medical assistance with FMAP, uh, you know, for, for program integrity improvements. But look, we know that Medicaid in the territories has been chronically underfunded for decades. The consequences of this inequity can be seen in the crumbling health infrastructure, emergency restrictions on, on provider networks, the failure to offer coverage of certain life-saving drugs, and even the debt crisis in, in Puerto Rico. Years of inadequate Medicaid block grants have forced the territories to divert more of their own dollars to ensure the residents have received the care that they need. And this funding structure has forced the territories to pay more than their fair share for Medicaid, much more than they would have to pay if they were treated like states. Last Congress, the committee passed legislation that would have provided several years of increased funding and a higher FMAP to all the territories. 
Thanks to the leadership of Representative Soto and Bill Arrakis, we were able to find common ground on this legislation. Unfortunately, I was very disappointed that at the last minute, former President Trump refused to support our bipartisan bicameral agreement and insisted at the last minute on reducing that long-term solution to two years. And because of that, we're now once again on the verge of another crisis. I believe the stakes are too high. The consequences of inaction are too tragic to continue down a path of short-term fixes. The territories need a permanent solution to their Medicaid funding shortfalls. They need a solution that ensures that they can make improvements to their programs with certainty and that the increased funds they're relying on will be there for more than a couple of years. Beneficiaries need certainty about the service that they critically need and rely on, and permanent improvements to these critical programs and to the health of beneficiaries can only be expected if Congress guarantees permanent adequate funding. So I'm glad our colleagues from the territories could be here today to share their perspectives. I know that bipartisan committee staff recently met with health officials from the territories, and we have also received statements for the record from all the territories. In just over six months, the territories will face a catastrophic loss of federal uh, Medicaid funding that will jeopardize access to care. Long before that, the territories will have to begin the process of contingency planning to make the cuts necessary to address this looming fiscal cliff. And this would include limiting reimbursements to providers, reversing expansions of eligibility that provided thousands of residents with access to Medicaid for the first time, and ending coverage of life-saving medications. But we can't allow this to happen. We just can't allow this to happen. So bipartisan members of this committee fought hard last Congress to secure additional Medicaid funding. With that funding, they've made tremendous progress. But that progress will be lost if we don't act quickly. So we're going to act. We want a permanent solution. We don't want to kick the can down the road. But thank you again for being here. And thank you, uh, Chairwoman Eshoo, uh, for having this hearing and for all the concern that you have expressed and leadership on this issue. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman uh, yields back. Thank you for your good words, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee. Uh, Ms. Kathy uh, McMorris Rogers for her five minutes of uh, uh, for an opening statement. Oh, I'm Thank you, sorry, Madam Chair. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Great. And thanks to my friends and colleagues for being here today. As others have mentioned, increased funding for Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands, Northern Mariana Islands, America Samoa expires September 30th, and I am committed to reauthorizing funding in a way that is best for the people who get Medicare, Medicaid care in the territories. I hope that we can work together on this issue to ensure Medicaid is caring for our most vulnerable in the territories and across America. As I have said many times before, we should be coming together in a bipartisan way to modernize and improve Medicaid, especially for pregnant women and people with disabilities. However, I want to be sure that we discuss three problems I have with this hearing before we have a discussion about extending these important programs. First, it's important that we hear from the territories themselves and get to ask them questions about their programs. There are serious and valid concerns about how we oversee the Medicaid programs in the territory. This hearing was later in, in the year. The OIG could provide an update on their audit. We could review Puerto Rico's report that's due in June. Over the last decade, there's been a dramatic increase in the amount of federal taxpayer dollars going to Medicaid programs in the territory. Are we seeing health outcome improvements with that spending? And if we don't have the data to answer that question, there's a gap that we need to address in this reauthorization. Second, we're going to, we're going to a straight legislative hearing on two partisan bills. These bills are only introduced or only have a, Democrat co-sponsors, and they were drafted, unfortunately, without the input from the Republicans. These bills do not address program integrity or getting better data on health care outcomes for those that are in Medicaid. In addition, the last time this committee met on these programs, it reported out bipartisan legislation. It is our hope that the majority will work with us on moving forward in a bipartisan way. And let's not forget that this committee, who moved a bipartisan bill out of committee two years ago, that would have funded Puerto Rico for four years and the other territories for six years. That work should be our model of how to proceed this year. My third and final concern is not related to the territories, but to request that we do some more work on additional challenges in the Medicaid space. 
We should be investigating the devastating reports about New York underreporting COVID-19 deaths in nursing homes. Families deserve justice. As I wrote to the majority two weeks ago, we should also be working together to understand more about the troubling reports regarding certain states undercounting and potentially falsifying reports of COVID-19 deaths in nursing homes. It appears that a few states took actions early that increased the COVID-19 crisis in nursing homes. Washington state was one of the first states with an outbreak of COVID-19 and nursing homes were especially hard hit. Washington state provided additional Medicaid funds to nursing homes accepting COVID-19 patients. We should investigate whether the incentive of increased Medicaid dollars made the crisis worse. This is an important hearing. And I'm disappointed that we will not hear or get to ask the questions that I believe need to be asked. Instead, we're going straight to a legislative hearing on a partisan, on two partisan bills. When we should be gathering facts, working together on legislation to continue federal support of these vital programs. I also encourage the majority to schedule a hearing as soon as possible to learn more about the tools that are available to ensure states accurately report nursing home deaths that COVID-19 or any infectious disease may have to ensure that future pandemics and Medicaid dollars aren't used as an incentive that ends up further endangering nursing home patients. We owe our families and those who lost someone to COVID-19, nothing less. And with that, I yield back. Uh, the gentlewoman yields back. Uh, I just wanna say to my, uh, uh, Republican colleagues, you know, you can keep saying that a that a hearing is partisan. It's fine, but it's kind of a broken record. Each one of you are legislators. You, you have a, a keen interest in this, as you do. Work with approach here. Offer to the issue as I work. I won't that each. Uh, to start out, uh, to start uh, to uh, kick off our hearing today, uh, each one of them representing uh, a territory, uh, just as we pride ourselves on knowing our constituents and what their needs are, uh, so do they. So it's a real pleasure to uh, uh, to welcome uh, each witness. First, uh, the Honorable Gregorio uh, uh, Camacho uh, Sablan, a longtime. Uh, friend and member of Congress representing the Commonwealth of the uh, Northern uh, Mariana Islands. Welcome to you, my friend. Uh, the Honorable Omua Amata Coleman uh, Radwagon, uh, member of Congress and representing American Samoa. Welcome to you. Uh, the Honorable Stacy Plaskett, uh, member of Congress representing the U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you for being with us, uh, uh, Stacy. Uh, and it's uh, it's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, the Honorable Jennifer Gonzalez uh, Colon, uh, member of Congress representing Puerto Rico, and uh, the Honorable Marco uh, Michael F. Q. San Nicolas, member of Congress representing Guam. Uh, so a warm welcome from the entire subcommittee to each one of you. It's really an honor to have uh, with us today. So we're going to begin with uh, Congressman Sablan. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes uh, and you need to unmute so we can all hear every word uh, you wanna share with us. Well, uh, good morning. Good morning and thank you to Chair Sablan and SU and Ranking Members McMorris, Rogers and Guthrie for holding today's hearing, averting a crisis, protecting access to health care in the United States territories. It feels like Groundhog Day. Not two years ago, the Medicaid director from the Marianas testified before this committee, along with their counterparts from other insular areas, 
on averting the crisis they face with the end of Obamacare Medicaid money. This the subcommittee did avert that crisis, and it's through your work, Public Law 116-94, and you provided the Marianas Medicaid with $60 million in fiscal years 2020 and fiscal year 2021. This funding made a huge difference, especially because the economic effects of this unexpected pandemic doubled medical enrollment in the Marianas from about 16,000 then to 32,000 today. But the money you helped provide was only a temporary fix. Could we have the first slide, please? Come October 1st, um, come October 1st, funding for Medicaid and Americanas will drop back to the statutory cap, $7.2 million, or an 88% reduction. This is the crisis we must now must avert. My proposal in HR 265 is simply to repeal the statutory cap. 60 members have co-sponsored my proposal, including several committee chairs and the two Republican members uh, whose districts are affected. So my bill is bipartisan. Lifting the cap may seem an invitation to spend, but in fact, the $60 million provided in both fiscal 20 and 20 and 21 have proven an accurate estimate of actual need over the last two years. And that amount lines up closely with a 2018 Congressional Budget Office estimate that permanently lifting the cap for the Marianas would only result in a $15 million annual increase in spending. That relatively modest investment has already proven its worth. Not only was the Marianas Medicaid program able to handle the sudden increase in enrollment as people lost income during the pandemic, but certainty of funding allowed our only hospital, which depends on Medicaid, for 40 for the 44% of revenues to invest in capacity, saving money and increasing quality of care. Could we have the second slide, please? Knowing Medicaid funds would be available, the hospital established an oncology center. Now, instead of sending cancer patients off island to Guam or Hawaii, most can get treatment in the Marianas. And look at the results of island referrals down by 90%. Not only are we saving transportation and housing costs for off island referrals, but fewer people sick with cancer must leave their families and face the rigors of travel. What a virtual site, a circle. By investing in Medicaid, Congress has lowered costs and improved care. How much more the Marianas could do if we had continued certainty of adequate, adequate Medicaid funding? Let me note, it is not just Medicaid patients who have benefited from this oncology center. Everyone in the community, even those with private insurance are better off because of the funding Congress you provided in public law 116 than 94. But with greater funding comes greater responsibility. And public law 116 94 required the Marianas and other insular areas to move towards the same program integrity standards that your states all face. And you will see in testimony our Medicaid agency submitted for today's hearing, the Marianas is meeting the program integrity requirements attached to the funding in public law 116-94 to the satisfaction of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Service. And this determination by CMS did not come in the last two months. It was made last year by a Republican administration. Further demonstrating the Marianas commitment to program integrity, our legislature passed public law 21-35 last year giving our Medicaid director the, the authority to transfer funding as necessary to ensure compliance and program integrity measures are always sufficiently funded. It is said she now has more reprogramming authority than our governor. In closing, I'd suggest we rename today's hearing. Instead of saying we are here to avert a crisis, why don't we acknowledge all the positive benefits that resulted from the increased funding we provided less than two years ago? We improve the quality of health care in the Marianas for those insured by Medicaid and for the whole community. We help reduce costs. We're increasing the program integrity that is so important to us all. So let us not say to this hearing is to avoid a crisis. Let us say we're here to seize an opportunity to lift the cap on Medicaid funding in the Marianas so we can continue the progress we have made. Thank you very much again, Madam Chair, for holding today's hearing. Thank you everyone for giving us an opportunity to represent our islands uh, in Congress. Thank you, thank you uh, Congressman Sablon. 
and uh, from your lips to uh, every member's ears. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It's it's always wonderful to be with you. You uh, you're a friend to all of us. Um, it's now a pleasure to recognize Congresswoman uh, Rodwagen uh, for five minutes. Uh, we welcome you again. Uh, delighted that you're here, and uh, you need to unmute so we don't miss a word that you want to share with us. Talo falaba. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you, Chairwoman Eshu and Ranking Member Guthrie, as well as full committee chairman Pallone and my friend Ranking Member McMorris Rogers for soliciting the views of American Samoa on our Medicaid program. And thank you for consideration of mine and my colleagues' bill on improving the Insular Areas Medicaid programs, the Insular Areas Medicaid Parity Act which will provide stable permanent funding, lift the caps, and maintain an increased FMAP for the territories. I know every state and every territory has their unique challenges, as do we, but factually, we are the most remote U.S. jurisdiction in the Medicaid program, almost 10,000 miles away, south of the equator, and have not had any commercial air service to our territory in almost one year. Not since March 23rd, 2020, that was the last commercial flight from Honolulu to American Samoa. Hundreds are still stranded and going through a month long quarantine process, two weeks in Hawaii, two weeks in Pango Pango, just to get home after being restricted elsewhere in the country. We've had two of six emergency charters from our local government completed with four more scheduled over the next three months. Our health services and only hospital simply cannot handle a sudden influx of thousands of new arrivals at this time. Our newly elected Governor Lemanu P.S. Monga and Lieutenant Governor Talawenga E.V. Ale have made a submission through their Medicaid director, providing updated data on the current capacities, utilization, and program integrity efforts to the committee, and will be providing additional information in the days and weeks ahead. We appreciate the temporary increase in our FMAP, which has been helpful, but we need improvement to our only hospital, which is over 50 years old, in order to expand and improve services and attract broader physician services. And we need more reliable and stable funding than just every two years. Our residents and veterans face challenging logistics and most often need to travel to Hawaii for more serious care. And the pandemic has shown us that has become a limited an option to our sick during this crisis. So improvements to our local hospital are, are needed. In normal circumstances, our people have only two flights per week to get to Hawaii. That limitation would be recognized alone as an emergency in most jurisdictions. Some of my constituents who are stranded are stranded because they were off island receiving care that they could not get in the territory. So services were reduced to our closed border policy, but that policy saved lives and prevented COVID from arriving in American Samoa. Today, we are the only part of the United States that is COVID free, absolutely. So I asked the committee to maintain our current emergency matching level. Eliminate the annual ceiling on federal financial participation, referred to as Section 1108 cap or Section 1108 allotment. Congress needs to address the funding cliff for the territories. Not doing so would spell financial and medical disaster to our people. During the pandemic emergency, we've been adjusted like other jurisdictions with an additional 6.2% federal cost share. So we are at an 89.2% FMAP. This has been welcome as we are indeed very much in a continued emergency state. And I would argue our program and hospital capabilities have been in an emergency state long before the pandemic. The Army Corps of Engineers recently did a study and report to Congress on the state of the hospital indicating that it needed a substantial, if not wholesale modernization update or total replacement. The Army Corps found our LBJ hospital in a state of failure and disrepair due to age and projected repair and replacement costs between 161 to $900 million. 
depending on min minimum modernization or total replacement. American Samoa Section 1108 Medicaid allotment for fiscal years 2020 and 2021 were raised substantially from about 12.5 to 86 million, with a temporary FMAP increase from 55.45 to almost 90.10. We were able to stretch our local matching funds. With an improved hospital infrastructure, we could utilize even more and potentially reach and exceed our current cap in the next few years. Stable multi-year funding with caps raised will be key to that progress. We do not have sizable tourism or diversified businesses and economies like the other territories. The local government and Tuna Canary account for nearly half of local jobs and our small businesses have taken a huge hit with the island closed off. But our young people continue to serve in record numbers in the armed services with record per capita enlistments in the army. And our veterans give so much back to our community. We need to carry them through with an improved hospital, VA facility. I look forward to working with members of the Energy and Commerce Committee on our critical Medicaid and hospital funding needs this year. Thank you, Chairwoman Eshu. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back and the chair thanks her for her uh, passionate testimony. We all can hear it in your voice, what the incredible needs are. Um, and we thank you for being with us today. Uh, I am going to um, uh, go over to the Capitol to vote uh, and place the, um, uh, the committee in the hands of um, of, uh, of Mr. Sarbanes, um, who I'm sure is going to do a great job. So uh, over to you. And I believe our next witness is uh, Congresswoman Plaskett. Uh, and thank you for being with us, uh, our friend. Uh, and thank you, John Sarbanes, for um, taking the uh, taking the uh, uh, chairing uh, the hearing until I get back. Appreciate it. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Eshu. I'm Ranking Member Guthrie. I also want to thank uh, the interim chair, Mr. Sarbanes, for controlling the time right now. Uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present a brief statement on the views of the health care concerns of the U.S. Virgin Islands as it relates to the work of this committee in the 117th Congress. Uh, the Virgin Islands will need significant investments in healthcare in this session. Even before our severe hurricane disasters of 2017 and the COVID-19 pandemic, the healthcare systems in the territories were under great stress. Specifically regarding Medicaid, the arbitrarily high local match required of U.S. territories by federal law imposed severe and unsustainable financial demands. Each of the territories tried earnestly to resolve this with little success until beginning in 2018, in the wake of the unprecedented disasters, more equitable matching rates were allowed on a temporary basis. In addition, while overall federal Medicaid funding to the states in the District of Columbia is open-ended, Medicaid in U.S. territories is unfairly subject to annual federal funding caps. Once the cap is reached, the territory must assume the full cost of Medicaid services. While the cap federal funding has been supplemented by additional block grants since 2011, beginning with the Affordable Care Act and continuing through the further consolidated Appropriation Act, 2020 and the Families First Corona Response Act, the Virgin Islands and all other territories face yet another cliff on September 30th, as has been discussed. And the federal matching funds the FMAP will drop precipitously by over 20 percentage points. Tens of thousands of residents of my district will lose access to health care unless Congress takes action to eliminate the federal uh, Medicaid fiscal cliff in the territories once and for all. Uh, listen, to have us continually come and beg you for money to be treated equitably is absolutely unfair. 
and all of us as members of Congress, all of you on this committee should be embarrassed that you have members of Congress asking you to be treated fairly. This is a bipartisan request. If you have seen all of the members of the territories, we are not just Democrats, we're Republicans and Democrats, and we are all asking for the same thing. So I do not see why this becomes a question of Republicans and Democrats, not all agreeing to what your colleagues who are Democrat and Republican are asking of you. We cannot vote on the floor when final passage on this um, bill comes, but you know what the will of your colleagues are on both sides of the aisles. And the fact that you continually make us request this is frustrating and it's demeaning to us as individuals, as Americans, to have to continually ask for this. I'm grateful that the committee took action to address the Medicaid cliff in the past to provide an additional stream of Medicaid funds from my home in the Virgin Islands and the other territories. That Medicaid clap uh, normally is only about $19 million. It increased to $128.7 million, and all of that money has been used by our district. All of that money was needed. Um, I have here and ask unanimous consent to submit for the record the written testimony of Michelle Reimer Brown, who's the Assistant Commissioner of our Department of Human Services, who testified before the House Committee on Energy and Commerce in June 20th of 2019. Without objection, that'll be entered into the record. Thank you. Thank you. And in that testimony, uh, in answer to the ranking member of the full committee, Ms. Um, Rogers' question, we use that money to put in place compliance as well as oversight over that funds. We've already testified that we've done that. There are pages of points that she makes, um, putting the goal for IAP opportunity to support the Medicaid program, the kickoff data analytical um, exchange, having uh, submitting IAPD to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, having MOUs with the Department of Justice to create a Southeastern Unified Program Integrity um, Project to ensure that this money is used correctly, because we have no intentions for the money not to go to the people who need it most. Uh, I have written testimony, and I will submit that for the record as well. But again, um, I'm asking for the support that you see of the members of the territories who represent, um, you know, territories both in the Pacific as well as in the Caribbean, who are all asking for the same thing for the almost 4 million Americans who reside there. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman Plaskett. Uh, Resident Commissioner Gonzalez Colon, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, federal funding for the territorial Medicaid programs has been inadequate to meet the health care expenditures for patients uh, to receive effective diagnosis, treatment, and care. And as a result of that, territories have to have had to finance a proportionally larger share of the program than any of the 50 states, just as the member just said. Puerto Rico, in this case, have received funds to supplement those provided by the Social Security Act to pay for his Medicaid program. These funds have been characterized by their temporary nature and the need for the renewal on a crisis to crisis basis and for the inequity in the reimbursement formula, which is consistently lower in amount with a lower FMAT when compared similarly with the states. Americans in Puerto Rico should be able to enjoy a Medicaid program with the same standards and benefits enjoyed by the Americans elsewhere. And Congress needs to eliminate the artificial funding limits that has forced, in my case, Puerto Ricans, both beneficiaries and providers to leave their homes and has crippled uh, island's healthcare system. Uh, just in 2019, Puerto Rico sought additional federal funds to supplement the insufficient Medicaid cap, which at the time provided only for approximately 10% of the program total cost, a program which co covers only 10% uh, 10 of the 17 Medicaid mandatory benefits in Puerto Rico. We also requested additional funds for measures which we were indispensable for the continued operation of the program and for the implementation of additional program integrity measures, 
which we have been successfully implementing. And I think that's important to note. Those initiatives took the 2019 baseline Medicaid cost from $2.8 billion to $3.5 billion for the years 2020 and 2021, and were accompanied by an increase of in the FMAP from 55% to 76, 76%. And those initiatives were implemented with $350 million to increase the eligibility from 40% to 85% of the federal poverty level just to cover approximately 200,000 additional beneficiaries with annual income of less than $20,000 uh, for a family of four a year. $190 million to increase reimbursements uh, to Medicare Part B providers and physicians with capital uh, arrangement. And I, I need to know that this increase of 70% of the Medicare fee schedule, which is more, more about 60% of the national average Medicare reimbursement, has been instrumental in helping physicians just to stay afloat during this pandemic. Many of the mechanisms included in the CARES Act to provide immediate cash flow uh, to healthcare providers in Puerto Rico receiving few were ineffective uh, with our providers. And why? Because they were receiving fewer do dollars per capita from the provider relief fund than any other state, than any other territory, uh, with an example of a per capita distribution in the island of $23.98 compared to the national per capita of $174.14. Uh, $106 million to increase hospital reimbursement uh, to at least 90% of the Medicare fee schedule uh, just to compensate uh, for Medicaid beneficiaries' attention losses, uh, given that the hospitals in Puerto Rico are ineligible for Medicaid DHS payments. Um, $38 million to cover hepatitis C treatment for chronic liver disease patients. And to this day, our island is on track to spend the total incremental amount for the sustainability measures by the end of the fiscal year. The additional funding that were provided in 2019, as just as the chairwoman explained, will expire uh, on se September 30th. And the amount of federal funds for Puerto Rico's Medicaid program will revert to approximately $380 million, or just about the 10% of the program current total cost. And, and this is the reason we need to act swiftly to prevent the territories and Puerto Rico's Medicaid, pro Medicaid program to, uh, from becoming underfunded and to provide sufficient funding to allow for a smooth transition into the next fiscal year without cutting benefits, lowering lower provider payments, or withdrawing coverage for hundreds of thousands of current beneficiaries in the middle of a pandemic. And that's the reason the government of Puerto Rico just asked Congress for additional funds uh, for 2022 and beyond, and to achieve a greater degree of equality in programs that are crucial to healthcare in the island. Programs in which Puerto Rico does not have a, the financial capacity to bear itself, and which are usually provided by Medicaid in the States such as the, the non-flu adult uh, vaccination recommended by the CDC, the non-emergency transportation and diabetes among, and among many others. I just urge you and all members of the, this committee, I mean, this committee went to Puerto Rico and have round tables with professionals and with the providers uh, and has addressed this issue in the past in 2017, 2018, 19, 20. And this is time to do it again, uh, make the funding available for the territories. This is a priority. Uh, for millions of Americans who depend on it uh, for our health care. And, and I just wanted to say thank you uh, for the invitation to testify. And I yield back. Uh, thank you very, very much for your testimony. Congressman San Nicolas, you're now recognized for five minutes. Please remember to unmute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable members of the esteemed Energy and Commerce Committee, Chairman Frank Pallone. Ranking Member Catherine Morris Rogers, Health Subcommittee Chairwoman Anna Eshoo, and Ranking Member Brett Guthrie, let me open by expressing my thanks for your graciousness in inviting Guam and our territory to testify today's hearing. Thanking all of you for your leadership in passing Public Law 116 94, which temporarily increased the federal Medicaid assistance percentage FMAP for Guam to its current rate of 83% federal match to 17% local match. From the prior 55% federal match and 45% local Medicaid matching formula, grossly insufficient for communities like Guam 
with among the highest per capita poverty levels in the country. Additionally, prior to Public Law 116-94, the pool of available matching funds for Guam was limited to approximately $18 million. And with the sunset of these laws, it will revert to $19.2 million in FY 2022. In the interim, Public Law 116-94 has increased the pool of available funds to approximately $130 million. The whole point of FMAP and a proper pool of federal matching funds is to enable a formulaic basis for our federal government to, able, to be able to support the Medicaid program as it is intended. Common sense would assume that if the Medicaid program is intended to help those of limited resources, similar logic would be applied to the FMAP and Medicaid cap in communities of limited resources to fund Medicaid itself. With Public Law 116-94, such progress toward ba basic equity for our United States territories has been transformative for us in our Medicaid programs and its ability to reach Americans as intended under the law. The current yet temporary $130 million pool at an 83-17 match translates into a Medicaid program funded at approximately $156 million overall for Guam which is $3,612 per Medicaid enrollee based on our FY 2020 levels of enrollment at 43,185 people and a population of 170,000. Assuming a static level of enrollment and a reversion to FMAP and CAP levels in the Medicaid cliff, the amount avail available per Guam Medicaid enrollee drops precipitously to $757, from $3,612 to $757 a drop of more than 79%. As evidently unsustainable as this is, a drill down of the implications of this bleak outlook only prove it more so. First, even at the current elevated levels, Guam's per enrollee amount of 3,612 is still 32% lower than our next lowest high data usability jurisdiction. And even today's elevated levels under Public Law 116-94 do not reflect per capita equity. Second, Medicaid cliff reversion means greater local funding needs to be expended for less federal match under current circumstances. At $18 million, local funds are approximately $8 million would fund that program entirely, whereas the same $8 million in local funding would result in more than $47 million in program health care, a difference of over 62%. Third, Medicaid cliff reversion means a return to Medicaid-induced medical cannibalism for Guam with lower caps and lower FMAP leaving Guam to fund Medicaid at a higher matching rate with a smaller pool and ultimately picking up 100% of the tab of costs beyond $750 per enrollee. Such medical cannibalism materializes in deferred maintenance of our facilities and equipment, which today have ballooned our Army Corps of Engineer estimates for a suitable hospital to over $700 million due to systemic underfunding of our healthcare system. Medical cannibalism means delayed vendor payments with an underfunded healthcare system stretching vendor payments to 90 days and beyond, resulting in exponentially higher risk-based pricing. Further, payment uncertainties implode Medicaid service provider environments, with private healthcare operators unwilling or unable to accept Medicaid-eligible patients due to unsustainable delays in Medicaid and indigent receivables. And finally, let us not forget that historic Medicaid inequity is but one of many federal inequities that have exacerbated health care in Guam and in our territories. We do not have supplemental security income on Guam, leaving our disabled without a basic level of support and depriving our community of a pool of resources to fund the operations of medical services service providers for those SSI eligible. We do not have the Affordable Care Act and its corresponding federal subsidies, leaving many of our people uninsured and underinsured. We must work to also remedy these healthcare gaps for our Americans on Guam to truly build an equitable healthcare system. The only solution equitable for Americans in Guam is actual equity. Let us complete the work of Public Law 116-94 by permanently closing the territorial and Guam Medicaid gap with FMAP levels concurrent with the rest of the country and lifting of the Medicaid cap also concurrent with the rest of the country. Thank you and God bless the United States, tribes and territories of America. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman San Nicolas. Um, and I want to thank all of my colleagues, our colleagues, for their passionate testimony. Uh, there's no passion greater than fighting for your constituents, and certainly that was evident today. So thank you all for uh, for being with us.
Um, we're now going to turn to a um, second panel of witnesses on this very important issue and the challenges that are, are faced in the territories. Um, Dr. Ann Schwartz, who is the Executive Director of the Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission, and Ms. Carolyn Yoakum, Director of Healthcare for the Government Accountability Office. So we're looking forward to hearing from uh, both of you on this topic. Dr. Schwartz, uh, you're now recognized for five minutes. Please remember to unmute. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon, members of the Health Subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to share MACPAC's work as this body considers next steps in Medicaid financing for the five U.S. territories. As you know, MACPAC is an independent, nonpartisan advisory body charged with analyzing and reviewing Medicaid and CHIP policies and making recommendations on issues affecting these programs. I want to note that we do not conduct oversight or do audits. Medicaid and CHIP play a vital role in providing access to health care for low-income individuals in the territories. The challenges are similar to those in the states. Populations with significant health care needs, an insufficient number of providers, and constraints on local resources. With some exceptions, territories operate under similar federal rules as states and are subject to oversight by CMS. It's frequently said that if you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program. And this is because despite common rules, states have a lot of flexibility in how they manage their programs. But for the purposes of the hearing today, it is important to note both that territory Medicaid programs differ from the states and that they also differ from each other. And these differences reflect their unique geography, history, local economy, and health system infrastructure. My written statement goes into detail as to how Medicaid operates in the territories. And if you're interested in even more information, you can find fact sheets on the MACPAC website describing each territory's policies related to eligibility, benefits, delivery system, data and reporting, quality, and program integrity. But the most important point I want to underscore today is that federal policy for financing Medicaid in the territories has led to chronic underfunding. This is because the policy differs from the states in two key ways. First, territorial Medicaid programs are constrained by a ceiling on funding referred to as the Section 1108 cap or allotment. Territories receive a relatively small set amount of federal funding each year, regardless of changes in enrollment and use of services. And in comparison, states receive federal matching funds for each state dollar spent with no cap. Second, the federal medical assistance percentage, the FMAP or matching rate, is statutorily set at 55%. For the states, the FMAP provides higher reimbursement to those with lower per capita incomes relative to the national average and vice versa in order to reflect states' differing abilities to fund Medicaid from their own revenues. If the FMAPs for the territories were set using the formula used for the states, the matching rate for all five territories would be much higher and for most, the maximum of 83%. Now, Congress has stepped in at multiple points with fiscal relief, notably in the Consolidated Appropriations Bill passed in December 2019, which increased the 1108 allotments for FY 2020 and 21 and temporarily raised the FMAP to 76% for Puerto Rico and 83% for the other territories. This legislation also directed the territories to make certain program, uh, programmatic improvements related to data reporting and program integrity. And to our knowledge, they have either addressed these issues or made important progress. The Families First Coronavirus Relief Act enacted last March further increased the 1108 allotments and extended to the territories a 6.2 percentage point increase in the FMAP through the end of the quarter in which the public health emergency ends. This is the same FMAP increase as received by the states. So as a result of these actions, all five territories now have enough money to cover program expenses through the end of this fiscal year. However, without additional congressional action, we anticipate that they will all experience funding shortfalls at some point in FY 2022. And at this time, MACPAC does not have sufficient data on actual or projected spending uh, to comment on the exact date of exhaustion. In the face of such a shortfall, the territories will make, have to make tough decisions. The options before them, including funding Medicaid entirely with unmatched local funds, a scenario we think is unlikely, cutting services, reducing or suspending provider payments, or some combination of these strategies. 
It's worth noting that territories like states are currently prohibited from decreasing eligibility standards or disenrolling beneficiaries if they accept the increased FMAP provided in the Families First legislation. The history of responding to crises with short-term infusion of funds has caused a great deal of uncertainty. And while additional time-limited time allotment of funds would certainly prevent fiscal cliff, it would ensure that in the short-term continued delivery of services. But it would not address the underlying challenges with the finance, financing structure that make it difficult for territories to plan, manage, and sustain long-term reliable access to care for Medicaid beneficiaries residing in these territories. Thank you for the opportunity to share MacPAC's work, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. You were exactly five minutes. Uh, well done. Uh, Ms. Yoakum, you're now recognized for five minutes. Please remember to unmute yourself. Thanks very much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, Chairwoman Eshu, Ranking Member Guthrie, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss GAO's most recent work looking at the Medicaid program in Puerto Rico. My remarks today focus on key findings from our February report that evaluated federal oversight of Puerto Rico's Medicaid contracting process. I'm going to focus on our findings as they relate to Puerto Rico's contracting reform plan, and then also uh, discuss some additional actions needed to improve Medicaid program oversight. Contracting is central to many states and territories' Medicaid programs, and effective contracting relies on competition. Competition can reduce costs, improve contractor performance, curb fraud, and promote accountability. Through an open, competitive process, states and territories can evaluate and select contractors who provide the greatest value to their Medicaid programs. Puerto Rico's plan to reform Medicaid contracting outlines a process, but doesn't yet offer details on the substance of the actions it will take. For example, it sets timeframes for determining reforms, but it offers limited information on what these reforms will be and the extent to which they will result in a more competitive process. It's not clear what changes will occur. And changes are needed. Our review of eight contracting processes did find that one competitive process, the largest, fully disclosed information on factors used to evaluate the proposals and make awards. We didn't find such information on the other two processes. In, our, in the five non-competitive contracting processes reviewed, three lacked any justification for excluding uh, competition and the reasons for the remaining were not clear. Officials explained that Puerto Rico law does not require competition. However, competitive contracts can reduce risks of waste, fraud, and abuse. The concerns we identified underscore the need for federal oversight. Unfortunately, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, does not oversee Puerto Rico's contracting procedures, leaving the program at risk. CMS officials noted, however, that the agency has treated Puerto Rico the same as other U.S. territories and states, and that CMS does not oversee Medicaid contracting procedures in any state or territory. Nationwide, contracts make up at least half of Medicaid spending, and in Puerto Rico, this percentage is 96%. CMS has taken the position that the states and territories are best suited to ensure compliance with their respecting laws. We recommended that CMS take steps to implement ongoing risk-based oversight of Puerto Rico's Medicaid contracting procedures, citing CMS's statutory requirement to ensure the administration of Medicaid programs using necessary methods for efficient program operations. The agency agreed. As I believe every witness so far has presented, um, GAO's work also shows the challenges that Puerto Rico and the territories face compared with state Medicaid programs. Congress has increased funding, allowing the territories to avoid funding shortfalls or to cover more services. However, our work shows that the temporary and inconsistent nature of these increases create uncertainty and can complicate efforts to maintain program changes and attain and then sustain fiscal health. 
these concerns are real. The need for an increased focus on program integrity is also critically important. Some improvements, such as Puerto Rico establishing a Medicaid fraud control unit, have been taken. However, more actions are needed to ensure Medicaid spending is meeting the needs of Puerto Rico's beneficiaries. As Congress considers changes to funding the territory's Medicaid programs, Puerto Rico and other territories must continue to develop and carry out planned reforms, measuring their results and adjusting oversight as needed to better ensure the efficient use of Medicaid. Uh, this concludes my prepared statement. I'd be pleased to answer any questions. I want to thank. Uh, thank you. I think I think you're back, so I'll turn the reins back over to you, and I'll go vote. Thanks thank very you very much, Mr. Sarbanes. I'm sure it went um, as smooth as glass. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you to each one of uh, our colleagues uh, who came to be witnesses today. We really appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I appreciate it. I think it is a great way for us to begin our hearing. Uh, and to the witnesses, uh, to the other witnesses that are uh, with us. Um, we're now going to move to uh, member questions, and I'm going to recognize myself first for five minutes. Uh, to Dr. Schwartz, um, the last time you testified uh, before our committee, you explained that the caps were made uh, uh, in law uh, in 1967. 1967, that is... 33, 43, 55 years ago. Um, do you know what Congress's reasoning was for um, uh, for putting the caps in the uh, Social Security Act? What was good? Do you know what the intent was? What maybe the debate would have been? I, I really, um, I, I'll be real frank with you. I, I think that there's a lot of bias in this, but that's my my thinking. Uh, so can you tell us uh, why they did this? Uh, I wish I could tell you. This is something we've looked into um, um, because it's frequently asked. Um, and so we don't know what factors Congress considered when setting the amounts of those caps. Um, they've been commented on as being um, insufficient going back to uh, the late 70s. So I, I'm sorry, but the legislative uh, history is is not crystal clear on this. I see. Uh, and when we talk about a long-term solution, um, how would you describe it? How would you advise us? That's what we want to do, or many of us want to do. Maybe some don't. Um, uh, how would you um, spell that out to us? So let me first say, um, in speaking on behalf of the 17 members of the commission, uh, the commission hasn't come up with a specific proposal uh, for a long-term solution. Um, and I, I think that we've merely pointed out that the short-term fixes are problematic because they don't provide an opportunity for the territories to plan and implement and scale and phase uh, the programmatic improvements um, that well, they, uh, the, that hospital, the hospital that our colleague pointed out is a is a case in point. I mean, their their hospital is falling apart. Uh, other territories are having to fly patients to other areas. It's expensive to do that. Each one should have, be able to have their own system. If people get sick, they should be covered. So, uh, to Ms. Yocum, is there anything inherent? to the territory's financing structure um, that helps prevent uh, fraud or abuse. For example, um, uh, you found that the territory's block grants result in stronger uh, program integrity than if there was the open-ended funding structure that the states have. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Did you find any evidence of uh, increases in fraud Thanks to the increase in funding, it seems to me that there are some that are drawing a nexus between the two. So, can you be specific about that? Sure. I, I don't. I don't believe that that necessarily is the right um, conclusion to draw from our work. 
uh, our work has found that very similar to what Dr. Schwartz has mentioned, that the changes to the um, the uncertainty of the funding stream does cause a lot of issues for any entity. Um, and the territories are, are not to be excluded. When you have a block grant uh, compared with a stream that is dependent on needs and beneficiary uh, and beneficiary um, growth and changes, you have a very different set of circumstances and a very yeah, different. But we set already of know that. We already know that. We're all saying that. Uh, right. But I'm asking you about. Uh, the specifics relative uh, to, so you do, let me put it this way, you do not find any nexus between fraud in a um, in an open-ended funding structure uh, uh, and what the territories have today? I don't, I do not believe our work has made that kind of a connection. Has anybody's work concluded that? Not that I am aware of, but. Dr. Schwartz, is it? Is anyone brought forth evidence relative to uh, a, uh, a supposed nexus between fraud and abuse and an open funded, um, you know, the way the states, um, uh, the way Medicaid operates for the uh, uh, 50 states? Not that I'm aware of. So interesting that this thing keeps coming up. It's like a bad penny. Anyway. Uh, well, I think that my time is um, is used up. Uh, the chair will now recognize the uh, again the wonderful ranking member of our subcommittee, Mr. Brett, uh, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it, and thanks for everybody being here. My colleagues uh, prior who who testified, and I just want to comment on, on my opening statement. You know, the subject matter is not is not part of this. Is a bipartisan subject matter. We all know we need to have to address, and we have we have to fix. Uh, the, the difference I was saying is instead of having a hearing, we're having a legislative hearing on specific piece of legislation that doesn't have bipartisan input and bipartisan back. So we, we need to work together as we move forward on this. And, and that's what um, is what we need to do. And first, uh, you know, one of the questions is the cap. And, and I think all of us, and I've talked with um, several of my colleagues, spent some time meeting with uh, Delegate Resident Commissioner Gonzalez quite a bit and talked to others about the level of the cap and the cap is sufficient. The, the captain statute that we've had to relieve several times is not sufficient, it is low. And so, you know, the question before we say is a cap right or wrong, the question is, is the cap accurate? If it's an accurate cap, is it right? And that, that's kind of where we're trying to go with it. And Mrs. Ms. Schwartz, as, as we know, none of the territories have requested additional funding over the past two years. Uh, would you agree that this would indicate that the cap amount put in place and trended forward for the past two years has been at a minimum sufficient to cover the needs of each of the territories? Um, I, I think that the um, the amount of funding that's been available um, for the past two years has been substantially higher than what was available historically. And um, we have not heard that it's been insufficient. 2020 was a very uh, wonky year in spending um, throughout the U.S. because of COVID. Um, and so there is some issues around unspent funds there, but, you know, year to year spending trends can be hard to interpret. But I think uh, we haven't heard uh, anything about these amounts being insufficient. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, a cap that's too small is problems. A cap that's accurate is that's what we were like. We like to to address. And so, Mrs. Yoakum, and, and so talking a little bit about, you said we couldn't conclude certain things from your report, but in your in, in your report, the GAO report, you mentioned contracting and procurement concerns that have arisen at both CMS and Puerto Rico. Around that time, Puerto Rico released their report on how they plan to address program integrity issues moving forward. So the, my question would be, are there issues within Puerto Rico's report that we should watch closely? such as issues that are not in alignment with your report? Yeah, I think what what is important to keep an eye on is there's two reporting timeframes that uh, Puerto Rico has set. One is in April where they will discuss ways to make their contracting procedures more competitive, which is a good thing. 
And then the end is at the end of the year in 2021, there will be further outlines of timeframes and the implementation. I think keeping track of both of those is gonna be important and getting more detail on um, what steps are going to be taken to make the process more competitive. Okay, thank you. And then Ms. Yocum also, in your testimony, you write that in 2018, procurement costs represented 2.4 billion of Puerto Rico's 2.5 billion in meta, total Medicaid expenditures. That is a, is, is a startling number, given that a 2019 federal indictment led to the arrest of Puerto Rico officials who unlawfully steer Medicaid contracts to certain individuals. We know that CMS requires states and territories to use the same process for Medicaid procurements as they do for non-federal procurements. However, CMS has not taken steps to ensure Puerto Rico has met this requirement. Should requiring CMS to ensure Puerto Rico has taken the steps be something we should consider in putting into place? Uh, I think it would be important to consider that for, for not just Puerto Rico, but for the states as well. It's, it's clear that CMS doesn't know for certain what is happening in terms of following procurement. Okay, thank you. And I just want to iterate again, I know we've discussed my opening statement and the concern with the two bills that I want to make sure my, our colleagues and, and my fellow uh, members of, of the, this committee that, that the current system, I know we've changed the caps temporarily, is not sufficient and it needs to be addressed and we want to address it. We want to just work together moving forward to address it. So uh, I appreciate the time and I guess I'll go vote and come right back. But Madam Chair, I appreciate the time and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I always appreciate what the gentleman says. I just want to add to the record, though, uh, that the two bills uh, on this subject matter are bipartisan. They are bipartisan. They're bipartisan sponsors, right? That's right. We, I'm just saying we're going to work together with the committee. And I think that's very important. I think sometimes the uh, uh, the um, the uh, uh, co-sponsorship of um, of our colleagues from the territory seems to be worth 75% rather than 100%. But these bills are bipartisan and they are a part of it. So, uh, which I think is wonderful. So we look forward to working with you on it. Um, the chair now um, recognizes Mr. Pallone, chairman of the full committee. Five minutes of questions. Thank you, Chairwoman Eshu. And, and thanks for emphasizing the bipartisan nature of the bills because uh, we have approached this in a bipartisan way in the past and will continue to. Thank you. I mean, the concern that I have, obviously, is that if Congress fails to act and the territories go over the Medicaid fiscal cliff, the consequences are devastating. And I know that uh, we have a number of territories here, but in Puerto Rico alone, I understand it's possible that hundreds of thousands of people could lose their Medicaid coverage if the island doesn't receive additional federal funding. And, you know, that's ridiculous in the context of a pandemic. And also, the, you know, this is a crisis of our own making. I mean, Puerto Rico has this Medicaid block grant. And as a result, since 2009, Congress has intervened eight times to either increase their funding or increase their FMAP. And, you know, I just don't want to do this. I don't want to keep kicking this can down the road uh, because the way we do this uh, Medicaid in the territories is fundamentally broken. And now's the time to fix it. So let me ask Dr. Schwartz. Initially, can you explain why so many people lose coverage if the ter territories go over the fiscal cliff, if you would? So it's basically simple math. If you have less money to spend, you, there are typically three things you can do. You can cut people, you can cut payment rates, or you can cut benefits. And um, when payment rates are low, that may be a difficult strategy. Um, when benefits have been provided and there are not many optional benefits are provided, um, it's harder to cut those. Um, and so that's the consequence. Well, I think it's also critical. Thank you, really, doctor. But it's really critical to understand who's going to lose coverage, right? These are Medicare, I'm sorry, Medicaid, Medicaid beneficiaries. So we're talking about generally very low income individuals. Is that correct? Yes. And then if you use Puerto Rico example, I you know, apologize to the others, but if you use Puerto Rico as an example, it uses its own eligibility levels for Medicaid, and that they're generally lower than those are used in state programs. So in this scenario, 
a family of four with a monthly income of $943, which is lower than the federal poverty level for one person in the contiguous states, those people could lose their coverage. Is that right? Uh, yes, generally, although I want to uh, know that Puerto Rico did implement a temporary eligibility expansion up to 85% of the federal poverty level at the end of the fis fiscal year, which would allow a family of four to make approximately $1,800 per month to remain eligible. But your general point is correct. All right. And then given their low income, it's safe to assume that the people who lose Medicaid would not be able to afford private insurance. Is that correct? Yes. So we know that declines in coverage lead to declining overall health. When an uninsured person needs care, they tend to show up in an emergency room. So what do you expect is going to happen to the health of these individuals at risk of losing their Medicaid coverage? I think we would expect that people would not seek care unless they were in crisis. Um, and that means that they would not receive preventive care, which could be um, immunizations or uh, routine screenings. Uh, they also wouldn't get maintenance care for chronic conditions um, such as high uh, blood pressure. Yeah, so I mean, let, let me thank you, Dr. Schwartz. I, I, you know, I, Jennifer and Stacy and, and, and Gregorio, I, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I mean, I believe the territories would only roll coverage back as a last resort, but without these additional federal funds, they may have not, they may not have a choice. And that's a choice they should never that the, that you know the territory should never have to make. And and we we just have to stop. I know I sound like a broken record, but we have to stop, Madam Chair. We have to stop these short-term fixes and look for a permanent solution. So that's what I know you're trying to do in the context of the health subcommittee and all of us in the context of the full committee. And you know I just want to make a pledge to all our our Congress people from the territories that. That we understand this, and this is what we want to do. We want to have a permanent solution. Thank you, Chairwoman Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yield back. Um, pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you everyone for being with us this afternoon. I, I wanted to start with Ms. Schwartz, and I just wanted to ask: Do we have any data on health? the health outcomes in the territories and potential changes in those outcomes since the federal government has increased the funding for Medicaid in the territories? Sure. Um, in general, I want to say that in Medicaid, most of the data that are on quality are um, focused on uh, managed care arrangements. And uh, four of the territories operate primarily on fee for service with Puerto Rico being the only one in managed care. Um, and uh, Puerto Rico is moving to increase its uh, various initiatives around quality, including recording uh, measures to the CMS scorecard, having plan level uh, report cards, um, using an external quality review organization to calculate and collect quality measures. And so that's all the infrastructure, the baseline activities that you would need to be able to assess quality. Um, most of those measures are based on uh, process measure, measures, receipt of certain services that would be recommended from a clinical perspective. And that would be similar to the states um, for which there are relatively few outcome me measures, I would say perhaps with the exception of um, low birth weight. Um, yes, it, it's something that I would, I would like to see us consider as we are looking at Medicaid, both for the territories and beyond, because I think one of the, one of the, the valuable aspects of the Medicaid program is that we we can see better outcomes. We can provide some flexibility to to look at getting better outcomes for individuals, potentially even lowering cost. Um, but making sure that that is also built, those kind of measures are built into the program that are encouraging the focus on improved health outcomes. I I would like to see that included. Is that is that something that you think would be beneficial for Congress? I, I think the, um, the caution that I would provide would be just ensuring that you have the that the territories have the necessary infrastructure and a scaled infrastructure to do those sorts of sorts of activities. And I think Puerto Rico has been working in that, um, and the activities for the other territories 
would it also have to be sort of scaled to what their capabilities are. Okay. Um, another question, the Medicaid benefits vary across the territories. America, Samoa, CNMI are not required to offer all mandatory Medicaid benefits under their Section 1902J waivers. Guam, Puerto Rico, and uh, the Virgin Islands are required to offer all mandatory benefits and are not eligible for the 1902J waiver. And currently Guam is the only territory that offers all mandatory benefits. I, I would be interested in knowing, do you think that the federal government would have better insight into the programs and why certain benefits are or are not offered in each of the territories, um, if those territories could get the J waiver similar to the American Samoa and the Northern Mar Mariana Islands? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if the availability of those services is tied to the authority, the J waiver versus operating under another authority as to um, the availability of the providers to provide the specific services in those territories. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what else I could say. Okay. May, may, okay. I, may, I, may, may, may I suggest something? This is Sablon. Uh, yes. Uh, ranking member. Uh, yes. Yeah, um, I think for the Northern Marianas, uh, it, it is possibly the limited uh, number of specialized care that's available in our community. Uh, that is why we sent some patients here, whether those in Medicaid or in private uh, insurance, send them off to Guam, uh, to Honolulu, to Hawaii. Uh, and, and, uh, and so that is possibly one reason. Uh, the other reason uh, which uh, ranking member Godfrey brought up is that nobody asks for more money. It is because we get a block grant and our, our Medicaid agencies are told operate within that block grant. You're not going to, you shouldn't expect additional money for this particular fiscal year. I hope that may provide help some idea of why uh, we have that um, waiver. Okay, that's, that's helpful. I appreciate you you adding those comments. Well, uh, yes. Can, can you, uh, Jennifer Gonzalez, can you, oh. you just 10 seconds? Sorry. Uh, I think that, well, the time, the time has expired. And I would just like to add that uh, uh, one of the rules of the committee, the overall committee, is that uh, uh, once witnesses have spoken, uh, they, can't, they can't go back to um, uh, to have them uh, uh, speak again. So, um, uh, with members. Okay. 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 Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Sablon, you got uh, uh, you got you got yourself in under the wire there, uh, my friend. Um, my my apologies. Uh, okay. okay. I'll, I'll talk to them individually. Okay. I, um, I, I, I do have some further questions. Thank yeah. you very much. Sure. I'll yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. And of course, all members have the opportunity to submit uh, uh, questions uh, to all of our witnesses. And uh, that's always an important part of what we do. And uh, I know I always take advantage of it and others should as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui, for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for calling this very, very important hearing. I am really deeply concerned about the devastating impact the upcoming Medicaid physical cliff may have on patients and providers in the territories. And while it's been positive to hear about the improvements the territories have been able to make over the past three, two years with increased funding to the Medicaid programs. It also highlights all there is to lose if Congress fails to act for the long term. If we are going to really address the historical inequities that limit access and health outcomes, we cannot be revisiting this funding question year after year. It is time to permanently raise the bar to ensure adequate funding that will improve our territorial Medicaid programs. Um, Dr. Schwartz, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about provider flight. Um, thank you, by the way, for being here today. It is my understanding that a state Medicaid program needs to ensure that hospitals and providers are reimbursed at rates sufficient to maintain participation in the program. Without adequate pay, providers may stop accepting Medicaid beneficiaries 
or may seek to provide care elsewhere, which leads to decreased access to health care. In Puerto Rico, there was an exodus of providers even prior to the recent catalyst. This island was facing a fiscal crisis and um, doctors are making half of what their mainland counterparts were making. Thousands of health care providers left. Then Hurricane Maria and COVID-19 hit. I want to discuss the consequences of lower reimbursement rates in the territories and what that means to access to care. Dr. Schwartz, I understand that 50% of Puerto Ricans are on Medicaid. That's a significant number. With that many families relying on Medicaid, what would be the effect of continued provider flight on the people, including the children of Puerto Rico and their ability to access care when they need it? Dr. Schwartz? Um, yes. Uh, well, clearly fewer providers would mean fewer opportunities to receive care, delayed care, uh, gaps in care. Okay, in 2018, it was reported that about 15% of Puerto Rico's provider population left the island after Hurricane Maria. With the increases in Medicaid funding in the last two years, has Puerto Rico been able to implement any policies that would help end the flight of providers from the island? Sure. Puerto Rico actually has implemented payment increases for certain providers, including acute care hospitals and physician services. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any information to quantify how those uh, payment increases have affected uh, provider participation in the program or access to care. Okay, I think that would be helpful to find out. If Puerto Rico were to go off the fiscal cliff, do you think it would be able to continue paying the increased rates to doctors and hospitals that it has been over the past few years? Um, well, as I said previously, provider payment is one place where any Medicaid program would seek savings and that, uh, for Puerto Rico would be a, a, a decision that they would have to make among the very options. Uh, provider payment is often the first step that Medicaid programs face, uh, take in face of budget pressures. So if Puerto Rico is forced to reverse the temporary pay increases and cut doctor pay, can you speculate about what effect, if any, that might have on provider flight and access to care? A tremendous um, effect, I think. Yeah, well, we certainly have heard from officials in Puerto Rico that any reductions in provider payment would result in more providers leaving Puerto Rico or leaving the Medicaid program and worsen any existing access issues. So it's clear to me that if we really fail to act, uh, these temporary policies to help keep doctors on island will end and we'll have provider flight. So I do look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to try to find a permanent fix to the antiquated way that we fund Medicaid in the territories. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize um, the gentleman from Virginia, uh, Mr. Griffith, for your five minutes of questions, sir. Thank you very nice much. Nice to see you. Chair. Thank you. And I, I respect the uh, committee rules, but I do look forward to having a conversation with my colleague, uh, Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, about what that, what she wanted to get in there that uh, when she was talking with uh, uh, Ms. McMorris Rogers. Uh, that being said, Ms. Yocum, I was uh, concerned to read that the GAO report found Puerto Rico did not take important steps to enable or seek competition. I am, however, pleased to see that GAO found managed care organizations to be a shining example of what is being done right by Puerto Rico's health insurance administrators. I'm hopeful that we can build off of, of what works and what has worked there. Could you tell us more about your findings in relationship to these managed care organizations uh, in Puerto Rico? Sure. Um, I want to caveat that what we looked at is the procedures used to, um, to establish and award the contracts. And we did find that the largest organization, ACES, was in charge of is, uh, establishing these contracts with different managed care organizations. And they did indeed follow uh, policies that are important to a competitive uh, procurement and basically letting people know what factors are going to be rated on and how important those factors are relative to each other 
is an example of the type of information that they were requesting. And, you know, what changes do you think could be made to better foster competition in these contracts or in, in other things that you looked at? Yeah, um, I, I think there's a couple of things. Um, making sure that those processes are more standardized across the different types of contracts. And then if there truly is no way to make a competitive uh, process, making it clear why you aren't doing something competitive. If it's an emergency or if it's a, only one source on the island that can do the work, having those kinds of processes more standardized across the contracting would be important. Appreciate that. Is there anything that, that you had that you wanted to tell Congress that you haven't had an opportunity to, to tell us? Uh, I know you want to answer questions, but I just want to give you the opportunity if there's something else that you want to get in to make sure we under that you want to underline from your report, et cetera. Well, I, I think um, beyond the contracting process, our, our work in the past has really um, shown the impact of the uncertainty of the uh, fiscal situation and the additional uh, funds when they when you're waiting to see what will happen, it's harder to make strong decisions that look beyond the moment. So I think that's critically important to understand. I appreciate that very much. Uh, I have about two minutes left. If anyone would like a, a time, I'm happy to yield. Otherwise, I can yield back to everybody who wishes to take my time that's left. Hearing none, I yield back, Madam Chair. Seeing, hearing none, um, the gentleman yields back. Uh, now, pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor, for her five minutes of questions. Well, thank you, Chairwoman Eschew, uh, for having this important hearing. And thank you to my colleagues uh, for uh, appearing before us today and fighting to stand up for your neighbors back home. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, under the current capped allotment approach, each territory only receives a set amount of federal funding for Medicaid. And I just want to be crystal clear, if a territory has Medicaid expenses and it has already hit its cap, it cannot receive any more federal matching dollars unless Congress intervenes. Isn't that right? Yes. And I understand a few years ago, uh, the Northern Mariana Islands did in fact hit their federal cap. What changes did that force to health services under Medicaid as a result? Sorry, yes, um, it's, it's my understanding that um, CNMI suspended uh, providing services for a period of time um, during which they experienced the funding uh, gap um, and, uh, you know, basically uh, also suggested that um, certain only, uh, excuse me, beneficiaries could only be seen by uh, one provider on the island, limiting um, people's ability to uh, go to their usual source of care. I can't imagine <laughs> that you have a, a health need and you're you're limited in in this country. So when a territory uses up its federal Medicaid allotment, uh, you said in your testimony, then they have to turn to their federal sources to make up the difference. So that obviously means that they uh, it has fewer resources for investments like schools or modernizing the electric grid or other services. And is that correct? Yes. Um, and on top of all this, you know, we've seen some amazing medical breakthroughs, uh, particularly in the field of gene therapy and biologics and more on the way. And these can be life-saving products, uh, but they are often incredibly expensive, especially when they first come onto the market. When a new expensive life-saving medication comes on the market, uh, does the size of the cap increase if you have a cap? No. No. So thank you for answering those questions. You, you're helping to make it very plain that this Medicaid cliff really puts the citizens that live in the territory territories at a disadvantage compared to uh, their fellow citizens. Um, I think the this underlying system is deeply 
inequitable, and it has been for a long time. Uh, even if we raise the caps, the territories will always be one economic downturn or one natural disaster or one medical breakthrough away from being able to fully care for its residents. Uh, so I think it's time that we finally end the unfair treatment for the territories and end Medicaid block grants. Ensure that Medicaid is there as the safety net that it's intended to be for all American citizens. Thanks, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize another wonderful Floridian, uh, Mr. Bill Arrakis. You have five minutes for your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. And I want to thank uh, all of you uh, for participating in this hearing. We appreciate it so much. Uh, Ms. Yoakum, uh, last Congress, I joined my fellow Floridian ENC colleague, uh, Representative Soto, in introducing the Territories Health Care Improvement Act, which added robust program integrity measures in response to the malfeasance. From what GAO has observed today, has Puerto Rico taken sufficient action to prevent the fraud and theft of government funds, which was at the center of the law enforcement action taken on July 10th, 2019? And if not, what more should occur? Again, for uh, Ms. Yoakum. Sure. Um... We haven't looked in great detail at what Puerto Rico has done um, since our that past work you spoke of. We do know, however, that the contracting risks that we've already talked about are there. And then additionally, that while the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit is set up, it is not coordinating well with the other program integrity efforts on the island. Okay, uh, you know, you need to please follow up with this because I, I think that's a pretty important question that everybody would like to have an answer to. Uh, uh, currently, uh, the, are, are there any territories uh, that uh, with post eligibility determination process uh, for that process to validate beneficiary program eligibility? Yeah, we haven't done work to speak to that. I don't know if Dr. Schwartz has. Dr. Schwartz, would you like to uh, comment on that? Well, I know that Puerto Rico um, is um, um, doing the reporting for the payment error rate measurement program and the Medicaid eligibility quality control program, um, even though it's technically not required to do so. Um, but I'm not aware of uh, what the results of some of that activity are or how their error rates compare to um, other jurisdictions. We need these answers, folks. Uh, one question again for Ms. Yoakum. Are there any concerns that ineligible providers may also remain enrolled in the Medicaid program throughout the territories or in, in, in any particular territories? I would say throughout the territories and throughout the states. Uh, that is an area where we need to be doing stronger work of screening and enrolling providers and making sure that they are not on the uh, OIG list for providers who should be excluded. So you said throughout the states as well? Yeah, our, our work has shown that there is still a lot of work to be done there. That's something we need to be focused on then. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, uh, the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, American Samoa and Guam are required to demonstrate the following by October of this year. Progress in implementing uh, methods for the collection and reporting of reliable data to the transform Medicaid statistical information system. In addition to progress in establishing a state Medicaid fraud control unit, can you provide us with an updated uh, update regarding the progress made to date on both fronts, please? Um, so the information I have is that um, um, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands are both reporting to TMSIS and Guam is working towards production on that. American Samoa and CNMI are 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 ex are exempt. Um, uh, although CNMI is beginning to work on that, 
um, both Puerto Rico and uh, U.S. Virgin Islands have also established their Medicaid fraud control units. Um, the other three territories have not. American Samoa and CNMI are exempt under their J waiver. Okay, thank you very much. And folks, these are American citizens, and we want to help them, obviously. Uh, but, but we need some accountability here, and, and that's why I believe we're having this hearing. So I really appreciate it, Madam Chair. And uh, if anyone wants my 22 seconds, they can have it. Otherwise, I yield back. Any takers? No hands? Okay, um, we're going Madam to- Chair, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, this is Congresswoman Plaskett. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Villarakis. I just wanted to submit for the record. Uh, I know that leadership on the committee has received a letter from Governor Bryant uh, of the Virgin Islands, just ask unanimous consent that his letter, and I'm sure the letters of the other governors have written to, um, from the territories that have written. It's already in the record. It's already in the record, much. and we thank you. I appreciate uh, that. The, uh, uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Cardenas, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Chairwoman Eshu, and, and appreciate uh, Ranking Member Guthrie for having this incredibly important hearing. Um, it is a unique and uh, horrible feeling to be uh, in this great country, but feel like a second-class citizen. And I believe today's hearing is exposing how, when it comes to something as precious, as important as human beings' health, it's being treated in the territories as though people are less than human or second class citizen. And I challenge anybody to try to argue otherwise. We've heard a lot about the cap and how harmful it is. And it's been to the territories over the years. I wanna focus on the other aspect of Medicaid in the territories that is a major detriment to the program. And that's the inequity of how the federal Medicaid assistance uh, percentage, otherwise known as FMAP, is calculated. Dr. Schwartz, uh, just a level set, can you briefly explain what the FMAP is and how it's set for typical state Medicaid programs? Dr. Schwartz? Sure. Um, okay. So the, the FMAP is based on this, uh, the state's per capita income relative to the national average with higher FMAPs for states with lower per capita incomes and vice versa. There's a minimum of 50% and there's a maximum of 83%. And those FMAPs are adjusted modestly each year based on changes in per capita income relative to the national average. And then for the territories, it's set at 55% unless uh, a specific increase has been given as under the Families First Bill or in, under the Consolidated Appropriations Bill. So therefore, when it comes to states and the FMAP, uh, that means that uh, you get more assistance uh, from the federal government if you have um, a lower uh, economic income. That's right. Okay, thank you. The FMAP is different for the territories though. As you stated in your testimony, the territorial FMAP is set by law at 55%, which is much lower than what it would be if they were calculated uh, like a state. That's right. Okay, Dr. Schwartz, in your testimony, you stated that some of the territories have struggled in the past to generate the local funds necessary to draw down federal funds. Which territories are you uh, aware of that have struggled with this? So, to, to my knowledge, um, all the territories have, have struggled with this, um, but I believe it has been um, a particular problem um, in several of the Pacific territories. Okay. So, the territories, it seems that all of them end up in a position where they have a greater need, and even though there's inadequate funding, even that inadequate funding isn't even drawn down, not because they don't have the need, but because they don't have the ability to match and draw down those funds. Yes. Okay, that, that seems completely backwards to me. And with all due respect, I, I think Congress has every right and responsibility to recognize this glaring problem and correct it as soon as possible. Dr. Schwartz, you also said in your testimony that you expect all of the territories to struggle with generating the local Medicaid funds if the FMAP were to revert back to 55%. 
So even if we do increase the federal funding, the territories won't be able to take full advantage of it unless we also increase the FMAP, correct? Yes. Okay, so um, basically what we've been able to prove recently with our actions of increasing the FMAP for the territories is that that is a much better right sized give and take with the territories and the federal government funding than the 55%. Has that been demonstrated? Well, I think if you um, look at um, what per capita incomes are in the territories, um, if, if you calculated them based on the state formula, you would come up with a much higher uh, FMAP. Yes. Um, uh, colleagues, I, I hope and pray that, that this hearing does bring us to a point where we actually properly fund. And one of the things I'd like to point out, uh, again, being the territories are being treated like second class citizens, in my opinion, in this country, if you're of a certain uh, um, uh, background or what have you, um, you're not considered suspect, even though you may actually do things that are uh, beyond suspect and even criminal. But when it comes to the territories, I think they were holding the territories to a standard that is unreal and is unfair just because there are territories. There are states and, and actors within states of the union that have actually done wrong, and they've been able to even run for office later, get elected to things like, uh, you know, U.S. Senator, what have you. But yet the territories are being held suspect when we truly don't have proof that we should be holding them suspect. Instead, we should be funding them appropriately and also holding them accountable, just like we would any state. I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chair, I'm out of time and thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, I thank you for the clarity of your comments. I think that it's a, uh, you painted a, um, a tough picture because that's what it is. But um, I don't know uh, any one of us, if we were in the position of any one of the territories in our state, uh, we'd be uh, shouting out from the top of the Capitol on this. And, um, I, I think it's just gone on for far too long. No one really understands why the Congress did what it did a half a century ago. I, I think this darn thing has gone on long enough. Uh, if if we haven't learned um, uh, how uh, essential to life is and our livelihoods, health care, we struggle with it in the 50 states. Why wouldn't it be the same way with people in the territories? who are uh, our uh, fellow citizens and uh, just squeezing, squeezing, squeezing. Uh, I, it just is beyond me. Anyway, um, I wanna call on uh, and recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Long, our friend, Mr. Long, you have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you all for being here today. Dr. Schwartz, I wanted to ask you about the history of the J waiver, two territories in the Northern Northern Mariana Islands and American Samoa operate their Medicaid and SHIP programs under Section 1902, the J waivers. Why were these two territories granted one and what have they allowed these territories to do? Um, I do not have information at my fingertips about the history of why the J waivers were granted, but we can certainly get that information uh, to you, I know the J waiver provides an opportunity to waive many areas of the statute. Um, and so I, we can provide that um, specific information to you um, for the record. Uh, and I apologize, I don't have it at my fingertips. Okay, yeah, I really would appreciate it because I'd like to get an answer to that. And I appreciate you following up with my staff on that, get the information to us. You may not be able to answer this next question either, but. Uh, do they want these waivers to continue? Are you apprised of that? Do you know if uh, they want them to continue? Um, I, I have not heard um, either way, but again, um, I, I can check on that for you. Okay. Um, Go ahead, I'm sorry. I just wanted to also, while I had a moment to correct something I said earlier about the TMSIS data, um, I mentioned that Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands were both 
providing um, GMSIS data and several others were exempt, but I want to make clear that actually the other uh, three territories must demonstrate progress on TMSIS by October of this year. Um, and so I just want to make sure that that's uh, correctly reflected. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Yoakum, obviously the focus of your report was on Puerto Rico, but I want to make sure we didn't neglect the other territories and the good work they've done on their program integrity measures. Are there any things we should consider implementing or reviewing for the other territories? I, I, I'm afraid the work that we've done on all the territories together is likely too old to be helpful here. Um, I, I, in general, what you want your Medicaid program to have is good data so you know where the money's going, good screening so you know the providers are eligible and in good standing, and a strong eligibility system so you're covering the people who need the program the most. Okay, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And Madam Chairman, I uh, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Long, and um, the gentleman yields back. Pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Illinois. Uh, Ms. Kelly, for your five minutes of questions. Are you on board? I saw her earlier. Uh, all right, then we'll go to uh, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Barrigan. For five uh, minutes questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I just want to state that I, I think it's incredibly unfair that territories receive Medicaid funding in the form of a block grant. States receive open ended federal funds, while the fund territories receive are fixed. The block grant funding does not come anywhere close to covering the cost of health care for the territory's Medicaid enrollees. And with that, I want to yield to a champion on these issues. Uh, my former CAC colleague, Darren Soto. Thank you thank so you. much, Representative Barragan, and thank you, Chair Eshoo, for hosting this really critical issue, representing more island-born Puerto Ricans than any other district, of course, than the uh, island of Puerto Rico and Jennifer Gonzalez Colon herself. Uh, this is a key issue. You know, last term, we had a great bill that came out of this committee where a majority and minority staff work together uh, with the leadership of Chair Eshoo and others. Uh, and I co-introduced with uh, Representative Gus Bilirakis our Territories Medicaid Parity Bill. And it represented a really great balance. It set a five-year uh, set of benchmarks. It raised the funding uh, for each of the territories. It literally uh, would have set us on a great path uh, forward. Uh, we know that sadly the Senate uh, went back on that deal despite bipartisan unanimous support out of our committee at the urging of then President Trump, even though I think there was great support among Republicans and Democrats in the Senate as well. Uh, so, you know, I strongly encourage both our chairs and uh, our ranking members uh, and our majority and minority staff to work together to see if we can get uh, something together that we could both uh, get behind that make sure we uh, once and for all set ourselves at least on a five year path uh, to get to 100% Medicaid uh, parity. We heard from champions like Representative Sablon and Radawag and Plaskett, Gonzalez Colon and San Nicolas about what, how it set our territories behind. When you think of the billions of dollars that they had to dig deep in uh, from their own local territorial budgets, uh, we saw patients uh, left behind in Hurricane Maria or uh, in the many cyclones we saw uh, out in the Pacific territories. We saw uh, that patients can't get transportation. We saw hospitals that uh, ended up not having enough funding uh, to, to be maintained. So when they were hit with Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria, uh, they looked like they were uh, going to be inoperable for many years. Uh, Ms. Schwartz and Ms. Yoakum, uh, my question to you all is, um, based upon that bill from last term, is there a path we could get on a five-year path to get all the services up to what we need to uh, equal to states uh, where we can uh, have that funding be equal? Uh, is that something 
you think is achievable in, in these next five years if we work this out? Um, I think the general idea of having a longer term funding uh, arrangement and a phased implementation of benefits or payment rates or eligibility levels makes a lot of sense. I am couldn't comment on whether five years would be sufficient to do the whole thing. I also imagine that across the different um, territories, you might want to stage the implementation of those different steps uh, differently, depending upon their own needs. Um, and that's the kind of thing that territories and perhaps CMS um, could comment on and um, come up with a plan. Um, so I think the general idea of it seems sound. Thanks. And uh, Ms. Yoakum. We'd be glad to work with you to help. Um, we, I think it's uh, definitely a, a good plan and we can give it a try. We're glad to help with data and doing the, some of the analysis. Thank you. Just as a close, you know, the pandemic has exposed how key uh, coverage and services for Medicaid uh, and insurance coverage generally uh, is to make sure that Americans in our territories are treated with the same dignity, respect, and access to health care as those of us living on the mainland and states. Uh, so thank uh, you all for this opportunity, and I yield back. Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize uh, Dr. Bouchon uh, for your five minutes of questions. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Ms. Yoakum, uh, aside from contracts not being negotiated in a competitive way in Puerto Rico, one of the more alarming aspects of your report is that CMS is not conducting oversight of Medicaid contracts at any level. Um, I want to ask, what was what has CMS said about changing this behavior for both the territories and the states moving forward? And are there requirements Congress should put in place or policies we should consider for both of the ter both the territories and states? Yeah, um, CMS has uh, said a couple of things to us on this work. The first was that uh, they they did feel like states and territories were in the best position to understand their own laws and regulations when it comes to contracting. They do, however, have authority to step in when there are issues or concerns that would lead them to want to know more information about contracting processes. I think that's an important thing to look at. Uh, when we ask CMS what circumstances might lead them to do that, they did not have a response for us. So uh, within current law and regulation, that seems like a really important place to start is under what circumstances do you want the federal government in um, and assisting. The last thing CMS said is that they would provide technical assistance and they can, if need be, withhold federal monies if they deem that um, necessary. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, for that response. I appreciate it. Sounds like we got a little bit of work to do in that space. Uh, so. Ms. Swartz, uh, the two bills before the subcommittee today would remove the caps from all the territories. If either were, if either of these were signed into law, would the territories be in compliance with the Medicaid program? Um, well, I, I have not read these bills in detail. Um, removing the caps in and of itself um, does not mean that all territories would be providing um, um, the full suite of services or conducting the full set of um, oversight or, or data reporting measures that are required of the states. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you would need to be explicit um, on, on all of those items. Um, also, I just further want to comment that as removing the caps without addressing the ECMA um, is um, problematic for the reasons shared earlier. Yeah, and I was going to follow up with that. It seems more, maybe a more important discussion is to provide long-term certainty um, and, uh, and, and fix some of the other underlying problems. 
Um, what does the long-term certainty look like and what can Congress do to help provide that certainty for the territories? So a couple of issues have been raised um, about or concerns about um, the adequacy of the programs in the territories. One being provider payment and the, the second being the breadth of the benefits. Um, and for a program administrator, um, committing to an increase in provider payment without certainty about the availability of the funds to back up those provider payment increases, I think would be difficult. And similarly, for extending a benefit, um, I think um, all Medicaid programs are in this situation that they do not like to provide benefits um, and then have to be able to say the next year, no, sorry, there's not enough money and we're not going to provide that. It's very disruptive to providers. It's obviously very disruptive to beneficiaries who have expectations. So those are some examples of how the uncertainty affects the program on a, on a very day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Okay. Well, thank you. I also want, want to know that seems, you know, like we're going to, uh, work off the extension we passed two years ago, but we need to understand for a long term fix, we really need to find a way to pay for the services. And that may, must be part of our work moving forward. I would, as a healthcare provider, I want everyone who's a US citizen, territories, uh, the, uh, and all the other states to have the same access to quality uh, medical care as everyone does uh, in my state, Indiana and the rest of the country. So this is really a critical issue for our territories that we really need to find a, a solid long-term solution to ensure that our, our, the US citizens uh, in the territories really have the same quality of program uh, and program integrity, as well as the same amount of resources financially for quality health care. And uh, I want to make, I want to be part of that solution. Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. A very generous comments, Dr. Bouchon. Uh, Chair is uh, delighted to recognize the gentlewoman from Washington State, Dr. Schreier, for five minutes of questions. Not there? Then we'll call on the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Trahan, for your five minutes of questions. Not there. Well, we, I, I think a lot of members have left their seats to go over to the Capitol to vote. Let's see who is, uh, is next. We'll go to Republicans, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn from, from where? Mr. Dunn, are you there? Then Dr. Joyce, you are recognized. Thank God you're there. It's great to be here. Thank you, Chair Eshoo. Uh, thank you for holding this and Ranking Member Guthrie uh, for allowing us to convene. I'd also like to thank my colleagues on their first panel for their testimony here today. First, Ms. Schwartz, too often we make policy each of the territories getting lumped together. Can you give us some examples of how they differ from each other? Sure. Um, here's one quick example. Um, in 2019, um, the number of enrollees in Puerto Rico was 1.2 million. In uh, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, it was a little over 16,000. In Puerto Rico, they have a managed care infrastructure. In the other uh, territories, it's primarily fee for service. Um, so those are some good examples of the scale and the scope differences. Uh, across the, the various territories. And in face, continuing on that line, Ms. Schwartz, in face of these differences, uh, not only geographic, but the number of insured lives that can uh, be covered effectively, how should we as members of Congress be better addressing this? And that's for you, Ms. Schwartz. Sure. Um, I, I, I think the the one suggestion that I would make in a plan for um, enhanced requirements to go with enhanced funding 
is consultation with the territories about um, their capacity to provide um, those uh, requirements and, and staging those in a way that's consistent um, both with what the committee wants to achieve and um, what's realistic um, in the short and the long term. Ms. Yoakum, I understand that we do have a need for stability and the goal of increasing the cap and FMAP for the territories. Specifically, I want to discuss Puerto Rico. Last Congress, this committee agreed on bipartisan proposals to provide four years of relief tied to important program integrity message. However, I'm concerned with what occurred with the former director of SS and the GAO findings related to procurement processes. What are concrete steps that SS has taken to address the concern from the GAO's report on program integrity? Well, as, as I noted earlier, Puerto Rico has produced a contracting reform plan and it has two key points where uh, the details that they flesh out their plan with will be very important to know about. The first, uh, the first deadline is in April where, they, um, where their plan says they will talk more about uh, how they will foster competition and what kind of steps they will take to improve contracting procedures. And then the second one is at the end of this year which has more detail on how they're going to go about it. I think keeping track of that, thinking about standardization across um, contracting processes as, as Puerto Rico considers how to implement its plan is going to be two really important things to do. What steps has the governor committed to take as part of this revised fiscal plan? You know, I don't know that I can speak to that. I'd be glad to find that out for you. Thank you. I think that would be important for us to have that information as well. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to have this dialogue. And uh, Chair Eshu, I yield the remaining time. Yield. The gentleman yields back. I thank him for his questions. Uh, I don't see any other uh, members at this time uh that um uh that i can recognize from either side of the aisle so uh i want to uh, once again thank uh, uh this panel of witnesses uh for your testimony today and of course our colleagues uh that headed up the uh, uh the hearing from the uh territories we appreciate uh each one of you and your um uh your sharing your um uh, you know, answering the members' questions. Hearings are very important and we always learn from them. Uh, I'm going to submit um, the- um, There's over 30 documents. Uh, over 30 documents. Um, uh, uh, they are statements for the record. And I wanna ask my, uh, my colleague, the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, if he would uh, uh, grant a unanimous consent request that those uh, uh, be those statements be placed in the record so we don't have to read 30 of them. Yes, ma'am, no objection. With you. No objection, yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, uh, members have uh, 10 business days uh, to submit additional questions for the record. Uh, and I am sure uh, that the witnesses uh, will respond promptly to any questions that you receive. It's a very important part of our hearing process. And at this time, uh, the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you very much.